Staying tuned in for another episode of Engage, Motivate, and Elevate. I am your host, Monet Fox. I appreciate you staying here. So today we're going to talk to a person who has been in education for over 45 years. He started a coalition of schools to educate boys of color. I'm super grateful to have him on the show today. He's been in business doing this since 2007. His name is Ron Walker. His organization is called Kozbach. That's C O S E. B-O-C, originally from Philadelphia and now in Boston or has been in Boston for a pretty long time. Everybody, please stay tuned in and help me welcome Ron Walker. So everybody, do me a favor and help me welcome Mr. Ron Walker. Ron, thank you so much for coming to the show. I'm super grateful to have you here. So glad to be here with you, Monet. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So most of the people that I have as guests on the show are typically from Boston originally, but you're not. You're originally from Philly. And, you know, as I already stated, you are the founder of Kozbach. So that's the Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color. Why don't we talk about your journey from Philly? Because I know I talked about this before, into Boston and what kind of helped you to stick through this region. Well, you know, I have to admit to you that, you know, being from Philly, I didn't have any intentions to come here. Yeah. But, um, you know, some things are out of your, one's control. And so in, in 1978, this means I'm a real serious OG, <laughs> right? I got a fellowship at Boston to do some work in Boston. It was a program called the National Urban Fellows Program mm-hmm. that was designed to put mid-career um, edu- uh, professionals in with someone who is a is an established accomplished national leader so i was able to um work with a gentleman who's passed away now his name is don davies and he was a national leader in parent and family engagement okay and that was based at boston university so i have to tell you you know um i had a few choices that i wanted to pursue new york city washington dc LA. But as it goes, you know, I wasn't destined to go to those places in Boston was where I was going to be assigned. Now remember, um, well, you were, may not remember because it's that far back, <laughs> but that was really in the, in the thick of the uh, Boston desegregation, busing desegregation. Okay. And, um, you know, South, South Boston was at odds, and, you know, and I said, why am I going there uh, to Boston? Um, but you know, on the end of the end of it, it ended up being the best decision that was made for me. Yeah. And um, you know, so I started a new career. I was formerly a, a teacher in Philly, mm-hmm. and uh, taught right in the heart of the uh, the neighborhood. And in fact, I taught at the same school that I attended in West Philly. So you know, um, so I loved teaching. Taught teach, taught for ten years. It was an all black school. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was um, something that I truly enjoyed doing before. Now, your path, to, your path to getting started on Kozbach is, is a little less traditional, but more, I think, is starting to become more of a tradition with people just kind of following their passions, following opportunities that come to them and being inspired by certain things that may come into their life. And that's kind of what happened with you. Can you give us a little bit of background about how you actually started Kozbach, because you started it later in your life. You had been teaching in education for a long time, and you kind of, you came into this, started a little bit later, so. <laughs> so you're being kind, that. you're being kind, but it's true. You know, uh, <laughs> I had I had been through, for most people, would have been the entire career, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I really got started on Kozbach. It really started for me long before I even knew what I was gonna call it. So let me go back. I mean, it started when I had a mother and a father who came from the Deep South. Um, They were part of the great black migration and came from, respectively, from Alabama and South Carolina and, you know, moved and and met each other in Philly. And um, they understood segregation. They understood what it meant to be be black in America at that time, Um, taking abuse, 
um, and all those kinds of things that um, meant they were second class citizens, so to speak, in America. Sure. And when they came to Philadelphia, they started their life. Uh, my father was a construction worker. Um, he could not read, he could not write, but what he also would remind me is though I may be illiterate, I'm not ignorant. You know, so it's very, very intuitively smart. Worked on a construction job, and I'll get back to him. My mother had a high school education, and she was someone who was really, really very passionate about uh, education. Uh, she was also someone who loved um, poets and black poetry, and she would often recite poems from Paul Launch Dunbar and Langston Hughes especially. So when I was little, little boy, she would always read this poem orally, you know, verbatim, Mother to Son by Langston Hughes, that talked about you know, never giving up, uh, despite what the obstacles are. You know, she would always kind of recite this to me. And she would always talk to me about the power of education. So, you know, that was kind of my, my roots. Now, when I was nine years old, I opened up the Jet magazine. I remember, it was a, it used to be a little small magazine. And uh, yet, yeah, yeah, and I opened up this and I saw a picture. This is in 1955. Saw a picture of Emmett Till. Okay. Now, you know, everybody knows the story of Emmett Till um, being lynched without a trial for something he didn't do, and it was a grotesque face. And I went to my mother and said, you know, what happened to this to this boy? Well, she didn't give me all the specifics, but she made me realize that, you know, in certain parts of the country at that time, you know, if you were black, you, you could easily be uh, accused of something you didn't do and punished, lynched, put in jail, beaten. And so I kept that in my mind. I always saw that picture of Lincoln and Hughes, and I said in the back of my mind, I'm not going to Mississippi. I mean, that's a, I, you know, I don't even want to set foot there. I don't want to spell a name. But years later, at the age of 19, after uh, I, was, I went to a college, uh, HBCU, Lincoln University of Pennsylvania, and I had a professor who was a famous man for those who want to look him up, James Farmer. James Farmer was the founder of the Congress of Racial Equality. And he walked with Martin Luther King, a lot of these giants. And he came to teach the university for a semester. He came off the civil rights. Now, remember, this is the 60s. You know, I went to college from 64 to 68. And so he came in about 65, and he taught this class on social justice and civil rights. And I was in the class one day, and he said, you know, all you who are, who are privileged, you're going to college, need to think about going to serve. And I just came back from Mississippi. And maybe you might want to think about that, but I said, I ain't want to think about it. I don't know Mississippi. So I was in a fraternity at that time, still am. And we decided that we were going to go south and work in the civil rights movement. So we decided we'd draw straws, you know, long straw. You wouldn't go short straw. You, you went. So obviously I got a short straw. So it was about seven or eight of us went. We drove to Mississippi. We stopped in Memphis because we had a classmate who lived in Memphis and we stayed at his house and we had raised about $1,500, which is a lot of the money at that time selling raffle tickets because we were going to buy some food and give this food out to the small town in Mississippi. It was called uh, Belzoni, Mississippi. Okay. And so, you know, we got the food, we drove to Mississippi and I kid you not, when you're driving to Mississippi back in those days, there was a billboard sign that said, welcome to the Magnolia State. And it was a Ku Klux Klan on the billboard. And so if you can imagine, these are set six, 18, 19, maybe the oldest might have been 20, black, black, you know, black boys, big Afro, big naturals at the time he's called it, going to Mississippi. But, you know, as things have it, because I think the other part of this work I do, you gotta, you got to have some faith that the most high said, I'm gonna get you there. You're gonna give out the food. You're gonna see what you need to see, poverty up close, you know, black kids not getting a good education and you're gonna get home safe. So that was planted in my mind and long before Coast Bar, but I knew I was seeing something about black boys, what was going on. 
long story short, let me just bring up the speed. When I came to Massachusetts, eventually I became a principal in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And in 1986, I received a piece of mail and I opened up the letter and the letter had the markings of someone who was in a penitentiary, you know, serial number, had my name on it, opened it up, started reading. He said, Mr. Walker, you may not remember me, but this is your former student, one of your former star students in the ninth grade at the Sayre Junior High School in Philadelphia. This is Kevin Johnson. And I said, Kevin Johnson. So I started to recollect because Kevin Johnson was one of my star students, right. black boy who was good looking, personable, very smart. And um, I used to tell him, I said, Kevin, you can be anything you want to be. Just, you know, stay cool, do, do what you need to do. And he used to tell me, don't worry about it, Mr. Walker, I'll be okay. So when I left Philly to come to Massachusetts, I lost track of him. That letter was reconnecting. Now he had seen me doing an interview on BET at the time when BET used to do, you know, good, good uh, public service things. And um, so we started writing. And he said, I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in jail, I'm in prison for life without parole for allegedly murdering a drug dealer by the name of Cowboy. I didn't do it, Mr. Walker. You may not believe me, but I'm going to fight for my freedom. But in the meantime, I've been getting my education. I got my GED. Uh, I'm working with some college credits. And I'm working in this prison as an inmate assistant in the prison school. And so 1986 was the start of that writing. Kevin and I are still writing today. And I'll tell you a little bit about you know, my last letter. But in 2006, because of Kevin Johnson's insistence, insistence, he used to talk to the principal of the penitentiary school and said, maybe one day my former teacher can come and speak to the inmates who are getting their GED. So in 2006, I get a phone call from the principal of the penitentiary school at Frackville State Penitentiary in Frackville, Pennsylvania. And she said, Mr. Mr. Walker, um, my name is Patricia Raymer. I'm the uh, principal of the school. And my inmate assistant, Kevin Johnson, who's been exceptional as an inmate assistant, has convinced me that you should come and give the keynote message. Would you do it? I said, yes. Flew to Philly, drove three hours up upstate, and it was the first time that I saw my former student in over 30 years. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's awesome. So, so he kind of inspired you to get everything started. You're already in Boston. You're already working in education. So talk to me about the, the program of Kozbach or, or what you, you know, when you started it, what it, what it actually means. I know I spoke the acronym before, but let's talk a little bit more about what the program is and, and how it benefits youth today. Sure. Well, when we started it in 2006, after I left the, 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 the uh, prison and after I made that speech, I knew I had to do something. Mm -hmm. Right. And as you said, I was a little older. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was 60 years old at the time. So here I am, 60 years starting an organization. But what I, the reason why I started this is because I realized that there was too many black and brown men and boys who were being marginalized, who were not getting the opportunity to show all the gifts and talents, you know, all the, all the innovators, creators and game changers. Right. They wouldn't get a chance to really do any of that. They were having a negative narrative. They would be the ones, the ones who were most likely in special ed, the ones least likely and gifted and talented. And I said, you know, I need to do something. And so the Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color was a step to fight uh, a narrative at that time, 2006, that was growing about black men and boys. Yeah. Okay, and boys of color. And so that was, that was it. You know, I said, let me do this um, for Kevin. Let me do this because I'm a former black boy, young man, now a man, and I understand what happens when you don't get a great education or you get right. you don't get the role models and mentors. Right. So the whole program is established to work with schools and work with their school leaders and the school teachers and the school community to make sure that they understand how important it is to educate all students well, especially in my case, my interest, boys and young men of color. Black males right. in specific. 
Right. Now, do you, this is a, this is a national program, right? You're not just in Massachusetts. You're not just operating here. Yeah, we're national. We're national. You know, we were, we, were, we started in Massachusetts. We started at Wheelock College when we did our first okay. set of uh, work, but we're national. We're a national membership organization. Uh, we do national events. Um, we do national convenings, and now we're doing national virtual convenings, but we're, we're right. national. I just, you know, we were invited. We were, we, were, we were one of the partner organizations for most recent town hall with President Obama. Yes. Um, that took place um, Friday. So uh, we're pretty visible in this space for the work we do. Good. Now, uh, do you have educators or facilitators actually in schools, or are you speaking more on the legislation level? Like, where are your representatives coming in at? Well, most of our, most of our work is done uh, with schools okay. or with school districts. However, we also have and will continue to support legislation that you know make sure that our young men all students but our young men in particular get the uh, the fruits of america you know yeah uh, and to to do to be all they can be so we'll support those kinds of things but we do our work primarily with schools classroom teachers principals superintendents that type of thing yeah now you wrote a book too. Um, you spoke about how important you recognize education was, and that was based on your dad and your mom. And ironically, your dad didn't have a formal education. He was illiterate. Um, you wrote this great book um, and thank you so much. And my son read it. He was super excited about it. He wrote a little, uh, a report, if you will, about it that he has to give to you <laughs> about right. what he That's thought right. about it. <laughs> <laughs> but talk a little bit about your book um, for those that may be interested in, or even especially, I mean, not just single moms, but I'm a single mom, you know, raising a black boy. So it was important for me, for him to understand how important education is, not just from his mom's point of view, but from a black man's point of view as well. So why don't you talk a little bit about the book? <laughs> and I'm going to show a copy as well. Yes, Solomon's you know, Plan. Solomon's Plan. And it's easy read, you know, it's done yeah. a thick book. And it's written for students and adults, you know, start fourth grade on up, or, you, you know, if a young man, yeah. a boy can read below that, that's, you know, younger than that, that's cool. But it's about what a father, what a black man did to make sure that his son was gonna be educated. Yeah. And the steps he took. And the sacrifices that he, he was willing to make to make sure that his son, me, uh, was going to be more than he ever could ever aspire to become. Mm -hmm. And there's also a book that's filled with lessons, you know, that are good for every boy, young man and man to remember. And many of, um, you know, young, many men my age certainly remember what it meant to have uh, that kind of work ethic, um, being punctual. Uh, being responsible, um, also making sure that you took care of others. Right. You know, because, you know, at that time when I was working, I started working, I was 15 on a construction job every summer until I paid my way to college because the purpose was for me to pay my way to college. Right. I did not want to do construction work and my father knew it. All my boys are playing basketball and I'm going early in the morning on a construction job. Right. At the end of it, I learned so many lessons about what it takes to uh, to be successful, uh, what happens to those men who are intelligent but couldn't go to school because they didn't have that opportunity for good education. So it, it really made me re understand what my father went through, mm -hmm. and what he wanted to show me. And so this was his plan to really make me, and what it also did, it made me realize that um, there's no difference for me and a brother who might be down and out on the corner right is that i just had the fortune so i can't look down on anybody right you know um but i need to help out wherever i can yeah um, and i think it's really important too part of it is you know there's a history in this country and there, there are people that are really great storytellers which i feel are you know they are the the concrete foundation of of life a good storyteller but there are people that are growing up without these stories or without a grandparent or an uncle that's old enough or an aunt that's old enough to really recall anything that happened from a personal experience. So when my, my son's experience reading it, 
um, he was, he loved the pictures in it. You know, he was looking at the older pictures like, wow, you know, this is what their classroom looked like, or this is, you know, so the pictures for him were really a good process of him really understanding what that story looked like, you know, like, yeah, everybody got taught from two years old to 18 years old in one room that for him really stood out like what wait why are they teaching them like that you know so mm -hmm. that prompted him to kind of ask a little bit more questions and try to figure out how the schools looked and and things like that so i definitely feel like you know the book is great if somebody's looking to get that is it where are you selling is it is it on amazon or anything like that well you can you can get it um the best place is to go to the american reading company okay american reading company um and they're online and you can easily get access and purchase the book. Um, and they're a wonderful company that deals in multicultural books. Okay. The American, Mark, the American Reading Company. Okay. And we'll post that up at the end of the show, too, so people can have a reference for that. Um, so what I, what I wanted to talk to you about, too, um, just to make sure that we kind of cover everything that Kozbach is, you do annual conferences and conventions. Talk to us a little bit about what's happening at, those conventions. I know you had to cancel them this, this year because of COVID. Um, but in the past, what are some of the workshops or trainings that, that you guys have implemented into the conferences? That you have? Yeah. And let me say this, though, we had to cancel the physical conference. We are hosting the virtual conference. So I have in the virtual one. Mm -hmm. So we've done two sessions already from two people who would have been keynote speakers. Okay. Uh, and um, the first one, Dr. Bettina Love, who deals with abolitionist teaching in other words what do we need to do not to go back to repeat some of the bad habits before the pandemic sure. okay because oftentimes people want to go back to what is comfortable so she talked about that the second speaker dr sean jenright talked about healing and how important it's going to be to go back to school and spend his suggestion and i agree with it totally to spend the first two weeks of teachers healing you know, because they got everybody's been thrown off. Right. So right. teachers have to heal in order to provide that same opportunity for your son and other people's sons and daughters to heal. Right. Not to rush back into the reading, right? That's going to come, but to really have a time for healing. So that's the first two speakers. The third speaker, which we're going to have on July 21st, is going to talk about the dehumanization of boys and young men of color in their neighborhoods. Okay. In other words, dehumanization is something that you've been hearing more and more about, um, about what happened to black men over the generations, you know, from slavery on. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to do this. This is going to be a powerful um, examination of what is dehumanization and what are the five faces of dehumanization. That's uh, July 21st. Okay. And where can someone go to register for that? Are they going to Coast Box? Sure. Sure, Sorry. you know, and we're going to start promoting it. If they go to our website, COSBOC, C O S E B O C dot org, okay. you'll both see information on the past series, but we're going to be starting announcing it probably another week or so about the upcoming uh, virtual events. Okay. No, that's then, great. That's uh -huh. July 21st. That's my son's birthday, too. So maybe we can, we can listen yeah. in for a little bit. Absolutely. Who's the keynote on that? Who do you have coming in to do that? Her name is Dr. Rhonda Bryant. Brian, and okay. uh, so she, it's going to be fantastic. In fact, she just uh, uh, there's a film that just came out that uh, your viewers might want to see. It's called I Am Human. It's about black boys. Okay. I, I, they go to YouTube. So I am I human. I am human. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that sounds great. Now, we're, you know, we're in Boston, but we've seen like nationally there have been tons of protests going on around the the murder of George Floyd most recently, but even Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor. Um, and I know that one of the biggest things around Coast Block is education. That's one of the biggest things that you stand for with your dad's whole plan for you to make sure that you're you're educated. When it comes to the peaceful protests, um, I think that people are for the most part feeling the same thing. You know, people are angry, people are upset. What do you say to those people who I think are a different group of people who are actually doing the right rioting and doing the looting and doing the more obstructive or, or destructive um, protesting? You know, what would be your thoughts around that group of individuals? Sure, sure. And in many cases, not every case, you know, a lot of those um, young men and young women 
Um, I often wonder about the experiences they had in school or the experiences they have at home, you know. Um, and I, again, I can't put a blanket and say that all of them didn't have a great education or they had a poor education. But I, you know, I often look at it from an educational lens. You know, what happened um, that would create this right. need to want to get something else that doesn't belong to them or to, to destroy something, right? right? And, you know, you can understand anger. We all got very angry when we saw a murder in front of us. Sure. You know, you can, you can understand that. But um, no one can prove to me or show me that uh, endless destruction of mayhem or stealing of, you know, belongings ever got us anywhere. Right. Okay. Now, if you can prove that to me, then I say, okay. But, it, but it's not going to get us anywhere. Right. That's the bottom right. line. You know, what we have to do is just what we're doing now for the majority of the marches. You see the results. Yeah. It's worldwide now. Okay. And if you don't see worldwide looting, because that's not going to be getting us to a to place where we need to be, which is to be recognized for who we are, to be acknowledged as not three fifths of man, whole man, whole woman. Right. Right. So, you know, we have to take, I mean, I remember in the sixties, you know, like I said, it was, we had our fair share after Dr. King was assassinated. You know, it's right there on the verge of, you know, one to break a window out. But luckily for me, I had myself and a couple of other um, of my classmates were embraced by an older OG at the time, was very wise, and said the same thing. If you can show me, uh, outside of being angry, what that's going to prove to be productive, then go ahead, here's the brick. Right. So I think, you know, as you can see, I think things are starting to get where people are. I just came from downtown Boston, and I saw, you know, the, you know, the group of sisters and brothers painting a nice mural on Boylston Street, you know, right. Black Lives right. Matter. So, we, you know, we got to do that, um, and that will get us, because, again, we have over a trillion dollars of spending power, mm -hmm. right? If we were ever to leverage that spending power, you know, in a way that we should, we could stop the economy. So right. taking the things and breaking the windows, that's temporary satisfaction maybe, but they're mm -hmm. not going to be productive in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think it's unfortunate um, sometimes because I get it too, you know, coming from an inner city, I get the type of thinking that goes into almost um, try to come up, you know, off of something. But I do think that it diminishes the impact of the, the protests a little bit, you know, just give somebody that is being negative or unsupportive more leverage of something to talk about or, you know, kind of diminishes the, the real, the real point. So yeah, that does, that does get to me a little bit, but I am super impressed and proud of everybody that's been doing that a, a ton of great work um, all over. I mean, I've been seeing different places, different countries even really showing right. support for that's this, right. uh, for this movement. So it's really exceptional. I do hope that uh, something, and I believe actually that something very substantial is gonna is gonna change very quickly. Um, so that's a good thing. You know, people on the wrong side of history, I think that they are gonna recognize soon enough that they might be on the wrong side that's of right. history. But we'll see. That's we'll right. see. So I wanna I wanna thank you again for the book that you sent out, Solomon's Plan, and make sure everybody can get that information. So again, that's gonna be listed at the end of the show. Um, we want to definitely build awareness around COSBOC. It is a national organization. It's the Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color. So it is essentially a group of schools with different programs that you have brought in people to facilitate um, that help young Black boys. Um, I want to make sure that everybody understands that. I know a lot of times there are moms or parents in general that are looking for programs to get their kids involved in, to keep them off the streets, to get them around some sort of mentorship, to get them around some sort of positive leaders. And so COSBOC is that type of program. Um, and so how would someone know what schools are affiliated? How would someone know how to get involved with COSBOC if they were looking to do that? Well, you know, Boston Public School, we, uh, we being a membership organization, as I said earlier, school districts, joins members, schools, even community organizations, you know, so because what we're saying is learning takes place everywhere, right? not right. just in the school, but also in the community. 
So we got community activists or members, but you know, Boston Public Schools is a code spot member. Um, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have a listing of, of particular schools, you okay. know, but what you could do and what the listeners could do if they live in Boston, certainly we have enough connections. Uh, we have enough organizational um, support, colleagues, and I mentioned one to you, Becoming a Man, BAM um, yeah, program, yeah. Sean Brown and- uh, Yeah, I think I'm talking to Sean in the next couple of weeks too, he's coming on the show. Right, and it's, a, it's, it's an amazing program because the other yeah. thing that we support was any program that takes helps to take a boy to uh, to, to the process of what does it mean to be, become a man eventually. Yeah. And so that's the rite of passage program. So we yeah. do that. Uh, Sean Brown's program does that. And that's what's you know um, ultimately very necessary. You as a mother, Monet, you're going to do the best job you can with yourself. I know this. Yeah. You know, but at some point, you know that he's also going to need that mentorship, that guidance that's that right. comes from having a positive man in, males, uh, in his life. That's right. That's right. No, I absolutely understand that for sure. Yeah, I, I'm grateful that you were able to take the time to come on, Ron. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's any other things that I that I wanted to know about you <laughs> before we got <laughs> off with that I felt was really important for other people to know. So July 21st, again, you can go and register for that next um, or next program that you have available. It's, it's coming up on the 21st of July. You can go to Kozbach. Is it .org? Is it Kozbach.org? Kozbach.org. And I would encourage people to go to Kozbach.org and just see what we do. It has, a, it has a six minute video of uh, the history, how it got started. Um, you see a lot of video footage, you know, you'll see a lot of things that you can learn just by going through the website that we, uh, we are an organization that's been around for 14 years, that's dedicated to the social, emotional, cultural, and academic development of boys and women of color. You know, and as I say, boys and women of color, um, and for me, um, the coal, the, the canary in the coal mine has been the black male. So as right. a black man, you know, you know, I'm super, super high on the fact that we as black men or black people need to really be able to be all that we can be. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to do with our, with our work. Yeah. And it's amazing. And there's opportunity for you to also become a member on the website as well. So we definitely want to encourage you to take a look at the videos on there get more information about what this organization does to help young black boys of color and also um, look and see how you can get involved. You know, there's sponsorship opportunities, there's membership opportunities. So definitely take a look to, to see what you can do to help out. That's right. All right. Thanks so much for, for being on here, Ron. I, I really am grateful. And I'm sure that everybody that's paying attention to you today is super grateful. Uh, Ron Walker, everybody, thanks so much for joining in on another episode of Engage, Motivate, and Elevate. I'm your host, Bonet Fox, and you guys make sure to stay tuned for another one today. It, 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 it is now time to elevate. Time to motivate. Time to motivate. Let's engage. It is now time to elevate. elevate.